watch them playing, they seem like ordinary children. By all rights, they are ordinary children, but circumstances have deformed them. Some of them have serious delinquency records, and nearly all of them are sick enough to need my help as a psychiatrist. The root of most of their troubles is that nobody has ever wanted them. Here, we try to show them they're wanted. This is the story of one of these 80 boys, Donald Peters, 10 years old. How he lost his way, and how at last he began to find it. We learned his story very slowly, by bits and pieces. But we'll try to tell it as it happened to Donald, secretly in his loneliness, in a lost child's bewilderment. In all these months, Donald has made no friend. We have never seen him smile. He has hardly spoken. He is one of the quiet ones. In all these months, he has never had a letter. But he is learning to endure disappointment. He used to hide himself to suffer. Now he wants me to know he is unhappy. This boy wants all my attention. At his stage, they're painfully jealous. If Donald's ever lucky enough to open up, he'll have to go through that too. Mrs. Johnson has very good reasons for not keeping order. Her boys are very backward in their reading, as in all their study. Children are much more deeply ashamed of being stupid than most of us realize. They are stupefied by shame. They've failed so often, they're afraid even to try anymore. Before they can ever begin to trust their intelligence, they have to be sure they're like. No matter how stupid they seem or what they do. Before they know they're liked, they can't like you. Until they like you, they can't even begin to learn. Donald has never learned to read a word. But here, seeing and hearing simple words one at a time, with nobody hurrying him, or scolding or jeering at him, Donald will learn to read. But not for a while yet. For just such a word as baby arouses a deep turmoil of feelings. And behind the feelings rise memories which still hold him in terrible hunger and hatred.
vanished father whose face he can't even recall. The mother who has no room for him in her life. Grandma at his home with her. A home he hates so much that even at night he seldom comes back. These are the memories Donald lives in day and night. As early on that morning, Grandma is out looking for him again. Wherever he may be hiding himself this time. She is wishing to goodness she'd never in her life have to smack him or scold him or go claim him back at children's court or ever look on his mean, mopey, sassy little face again. That's how a day begins. Same old buzzer. Somebody else hauling him home by the nape of the neck. Same old hopeless confusion, misunderstanding, rage and pain and fear and hatred. Judy without love.
peacemaking that failed. A heavy burden for an old woman. A heavy burden for a little boy. And that's the way it keeps on going. This is one of the things that counts most heavily against Donald. When he does go to school, he can't seem to learn or even pay attention. He's way behind the children he sits with. The teachers can't spare time for him.
course, the streets of a city can be a wonderful school. Freedom is wonderful, too. But if you're as lonely as Donald is, all you learn is more loneliness. And Donald's kind of freedom is solitary confinement. Everybody else has some place to go, some definite thing to do. And after a while, you even want to go home. is no refuge. Home is a place of unutterable boredom, sadness, wild daydreams, vengefulness, rebellion. their friends will do almost anything to feel they belong.
But Donald doesn't know yet how to keep this kind of friend. He's failed again. The baby in him is desperate to be comforted. Nobody asked you to swallow nothing. Don't give me that stuff. Wasn't trying to give you no stuff. What you call it? Don't call it nothing. You tell me uh, every time I say... Now, what's the matter? Woman, where's my necktie? here with Arlene.
Have you got something to give the kids? after he saw the last of his people, he was still paralyzed by his memory. There wasn't much we could do for him until he made some move himself. Once every year at Wiltwick, a pretty thick run of fish. If you're good at it, you can just knock them on the head. a new counselor named Clarence. Only watching and very shyly. For children of Donald's kind have a desperate terror of rejection. But now at last, against all that terror, in front of everybody, 
Donald took the greatest risk of his life and made the first friend of his life. It was a great day for Donald and for us too. One of our social workers came over and congratulated Clarence. He wondered what for. But Miss Roberts knew what Donald had been through. And after she told Clarence a little about the child, Clarence realized he had been partner to a small but very important miracle. From then on, Donald was as touchy as a boil. Children always are when their affections begin to be stirred up. He was touchiest of all toward his new friend. If Clarence handed him a shirt with a hole in it, Donald was sure it was a calculated personal betrayal. All the meaner in front of the other boy. Clarence wondered what the Dickens was wrong with him. It was all to the good, though. Now that Donald was beginning to open up, almost anything could happen. One day in crafts class, Donald was making a little bowl. He wanted to make it look like a seashell. He couldn't say why. He just wanted it to be a seashell. Donald seemed to be doing fine. Suddenly, the hands that were working in the damp clay of the unborn shell drew him into a deep quicksand. Donald, what's the trouble? Okay, try it again. The bottom of memory has opened and engulfed him. All afternoon in great misery and turmoil, he must hunt among those memories alone.
Donald's kind of hunting would exhaust and frighten stronger and wiser people than he. In the past, when he was in trouble, Donald had nobody to turn to. Now, for the first time, he feels the life-giving warmth and gratitude that comes of being comforted. And for the first time, with Clarence's help, he begins to take his place among the other boys. Even his failure with the shell is the beginning of a victory. For with it, he has begun to make something tangible with his hands out of the depths of his past unhappiness. Altogether, it looks as if he were really beginning to take hold of his life. And during these next weeks, as a matter of fact, everything is going to go much better for him. Donald will do some butterfly chasing of his own. He gets to be a pretty good basketball forward for his side. Much to his astonishment, he'll begin to read. In his appointments with me, he becomes almost articulate. Most important of all for Donald, he goes back to the little seashell and keeps at it until he finishes it. That gives him his first real sense of accomplishment. By now, he seems to have become very much a part of the life here. He hardly seems like the same boy anymore. But he isn't well yet, by any means. So much can happen blindly, by mischance. And on this morning, a great deal happened to Donald. When he saw that Miss Roberts was driving into town, Donald suddenly realized whom he had made the bowl for. Come on, get Come on. on. He had made it for his mother, and now it was on its way. But it was only on its way to my office. When Miss Roberts told me about the bowl, I decided it was time to tell Donald the facts. Hey, 
Donald's mother had disappeared. Not even his grandmother knew where she was. What he made of this knowledge, and what came of it, brought about the most important turning point in Donald's life with us. is trying to do takes a lot of courage, a strong will towards reality and life, to suffer the uprooting of the dearest thing you have known and try to transplant your affections, to go ahead rather than retreat, to put your need and your love once again in another's trust when all of your life and again so recently you have been betrayed. Donald has come a long way with us, thanks largely to his friendship with Clarence, a long way. A mirror is no longer a focus for misery and self-hatred, but more like a window on a happy present and a hopeful future. An image of a happy child, of the man he hopes to be like. But he hasn't come far enough. A starving man can't share food no matter how much there is. And a child so desperate for affection can't bear to share it.
him. What are you doing to him anyway? What we do, he tear up our bed. Now, what do you do that for? And what did you do? Now, you go over and fix up that lock and be quick about it. You other guys clear out here. We're going to fix our bed. Don't worry about that. Let me handle it. Now, you're going to move on you. Now, Don, you fix back those beds. What, do you want to make a mess of things, huh? What got into you? Is something wrong? Something happened? All right, now, let's straighten out these beds, huh? question whether Donald needed more to talk out whatever was disturbing him or live it out first. The director and I agreed we'd better give him a chance to work it out his own way. Chances have to be taken because, after all, there are things you can only find out for yourself and by yourself. Things nobody can ever find out for you, or ever tell you, or ever show you. They're too deep inside you. And as the day grew darker and colder, Donald found them out.
He saw his mother and all that he wished of her and could never hope for. Looking back, knowing as much about it now as Donald knew then, we can date a good deal from his runaway. When he gave back the lighter, he didn't only begin to put an end to his stealing. He gave back his extravagant emotional claims on Clarence, his extreme hypersensitive jealousy. friends his own age as well. With his experience on the tracks, the baby and Donald began to die. The child was born. He will still suffer in remembrance of his people, but he is less liable than before to enshrine an unreality. He can better accept his motherlessness, his homelessness, this temporary home.
There is no happy ending to Donald's story. The happiest thing we can say is that the worst of his loneliness, the loneliness that paralyzes and kills, is ended. We can help him now. Now that he's begun to make peace with his past, begins to feel at home in the present, we can help him to equip himself against the future. That's the most we can hope to do here at Wilkwick for any of the boys who lie sleeping here, to clear away some of the great harm they suffered in the difficult world they came from, to make them a little better able to take care of themselves in the difficult world they must return to. A little better able to live usefully and generously in that world. A little better able to care for the children they will have than their parents were to care for them. Lest the generations of those maimed in childhood, each making the next in its own image, create upon the darkness, like mirrors locked face to face, an infinite corridor of despair. To keep open a place of healing, courage, and hope, for as many as we can afford to care for among the thousands of those children who lie sleeping tonight in impoverished little rooms and in poor fugitive derelict holes in the rotten depths of the city. Whom poverty, bewilderment, anger, pride, fear, lovelessness, may drive into sickness and into crime. And who, in the world which disfigures them, cannot be cared for and are not wanted.